Welcome to the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Rosensweet, mom of three young people, peaceful parenting coach, and your cheerleader and guide on all things parenting. Each week, we'll cover the tools, strategies, and support you need to end the yelling and power struggles and encourage your kids to listen and cooperate so that you can enjoy your family time. I'm happy to say we have a great relationship with our three kids. The teen years have been easy and joyful, not because we're special unicorns, but because my kids were raised with peaceful parenting. I've also helped so many parents just like you stop struggling and enjoy their kids again. I'm excited to be here with you today and bring you the insight and information you need to make your parenting journey a little more peaceful. Let's dive into this week's conversation. Hey all, welcome back to another episode of the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. Today's episode is a guest expert interview with Linda Murphy. Linda is a speech language pathologist and we had such a great conversation. If you have a child who is strong-willed or you have a child who is a little bit rigid or a black and white thinker, trouble with flexibility, or you have a child who maybe melts down when they make a mistake, you are going to want to listen to this episode because she's introduced a tool, a communication tool called declarative language. If you have no idea what that means, don't worry because she's going to explain it to us. And even if you have a child who you don't have any of those issues with, but you want another tool in your peaceful parenting toolbox that's going to improve your relationship with your child and strengthen the bond that you have and really build and grow that respect that you and your child have for each other. If you've been following my work, you hear me talking about that goodwill bank account. We want that bank account to be nice and beefy and full of deposits of goodwill. Well, this style of communication that Linda is going to be talking to us about, declarative language, is really a way to make deposits into that goodwill bank account. Before we dive in and meet Linda, I just want to remind you that my How to Stop Yelling at Your Kids course is available and it's free. For any of you who have trouble staying calm when things are hard or don't really know how to calm yourself when you've already started to lose it. And if you have a kid who is one of the things I just mentioned is strong-willed or rigid thinker or has trouble with perfectionism, it's going to be really important to stay calm when things are hard, right? So if you would like to check out that course, it is at sarahrosensweet.com slash yelling. Again, my free how to stop yelling at your kids course is available at sarahrosensweet.com slash yelling. So please check it out or share it with a friend. If you have a friend that you think would like an introduction to peaceful parenting, it's a really, really great place to start. As you know, you hear me say this all the time. We always start with self-regulation when things are tough. Okay, let's meet Linda. I can't wait for you to learn about what she says, and I just thought it was such an interesting conversation. Let's let's meet Linda. Hi, Linda. Welcome to the podcast. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, I'm so excited that you said yes. I love your book. So tell us a little bit about who you are and, and what you do. Mm-hmm. My name is Linda Murphy, and I'm a speech-language pathologist, but also an RDI consultant, which stands for Relationship Development Intervention. I work with individuals of all ages, but I find a lot of people who find me are looking for support around social learning. So I know often speech therapy, people might think about articulation, that sort of thing. But I really, my angle and my expertise is in the area of social communication and social learning and just helping everybody feel successful, help everyone to be and feel successful in their communication with other people. I love it. So I just finished reading your book, The Declarative Language Handbook, which is, I think I saw you on the Bright and Quirky Summit, which is how I found out about your work. And I think that, well, first of all, can you explain to us, I I want you to talk about declarative language because I think it it fits so much in with peaceful parenting and how we, I'm going to give it away a little bit, but what I, what I got from declarative language was that it's really relationship-based. It's a relationship-based way of communicating rather than a control based way of communicating. And and that's where I think the beautiful Venn diagram happens between your work and my work. So that's why I wanted to have you on, because I just think that that all parents, whether their kids have social learning challenges or not, I think all parents should know about this, this way of communication. So explain to us, if you will, what declarative language is. Yeah. And I know when I wrote it, it was for the community that I work within, But so much I hear that all parents can benefit from this tool, you know, and I use it also as a parent. But essentially, you know, the first step is just being mindful of our own communication and recognizing that what we say and how we say it 
really matters and it can make a difference in what follows. So where I like to start is thinking about what declarative language is not. So the opposite of declarative language might be a command, which I call an imperative in my book. So it just means that you're telling someone exactly what to do or exactly what to say. I know. So about in that our Latin. home life, it might be put on your coat, get your shoes, do your homework, right? Do your laundry, put that dish in the dishwasher. So they're just commands that expect something very specific. Declarative language is also not a question. So a question might be, what should you be doing right now? What should you do with that dish? <laughs> Where should you put that? Where should you put your shoes, for example? And what kind of, what imperative language and question asking can have in common is that they place demands on our learners in the moment to come up with an answer or to do a specific action. So it places a demand. It also places time pressure. So declarative language, in contrast, is just commenting. So there's lots of things that we see, that we notice, that we remember, that we're thinking about. And you just really get in the habit of saying these things out loud to our kids, to our learners, so that they can share in the knowledge that we have, the observations that we're making. And essentially what, what you do over time is you use more and more declarative languages instead of telling kids what to do. You're empowering them to notice things on their own, to problem solve on their own, to share memories on their own. You're modeling that thought process that's important for executive functioning or decision making. Like I know you talk a lot about just giving kids that agency, like we want to give them that information so that they can be good decision makers in the future. But they don't have that information unless we give it to them in a really generous way. So declarative language really helps you get in that flow of saying, you know, here, the, here's this decision upon us, and I want to share with you what I know from my memories, from my life experience, from my <laughs> predictions into the future, so that we can share that knowledge together, so that you can then be empowered to make a decision that's good for you. You know, that's kind of where it's not always where you start with declarative language, because that's just as you get more comfortable and it gets more sophisticated. You see all the beautiful places that declarative language can take you, such as that. But when you're just starting out, the first step is always just notice your own communication. Notice how much you place demands or use imperatives. Notice how many questions you ask. And just see if you can take a step back and shift and phrase things as comments instead of um, more demand-based language. Mm -hmm. And even I'll just give you a few examples just so people can start to see what this sounds like. So say you typically might say, put on your shoes, you might instead instead say, you know, I notice you need your shoes, or I see your shoes by the door, or it's almost time to go out. I'm thinking about what we need before we go out. And you can really vary the complexity or the abstraction of the language that you're using based on the learner in the moment. So the declarative mm -hmm. comment you use with a youngster, say a two-year-old or a three-year-old, or a more concrete learner is going to be different than what you might use with a teen or a tween or someone who's a little bit further along in their language development. But your goal is always to create space to empower the individual, to connect with them. You know, it's not about, again, it's not about placing a demand in a different way. It's really about sharing information at the level that is just right for that person that you're with so that you both stay positively connected as you move through life, as you move through transitions, and just really feel that connection and partnership with each other. Again, it's that relationship piece, right? It's mm -hmm. like an invitation to collaborate on the process and what needs to happen rather than I'm in control and you're going to do my bidding. And, and I think, you know, Maybe there are a few parents listening who have kids who would respond well to go and put your shoes on and they would just go and put their shoes on. But in general, the people that I work with in my community are not the people who, when you say go put your shoes on, their kid just goes and puts their shoes on. So we talk a lot about how to get cooperation without, you know, giving commands. And and I often say the statistic, I don't know if you've heard this, that and I say this when I talk about strong-willed kids because, you know, a lot of this is really, as I was reading this, I'm like, this is perfect for people with strong-willed kids and that kids get over 200 directives a day, like just in their everyday, you know, life, the 200 times a day, people are telling them what to do. And I think at least 
and I know you speak a lot to educators as well in your book, but even if just as parents, we can move away from that imperative towards the declarative language that will go a long way to, you know, making things easier in our communication and our relationships with our kids. And, and so another thing that I wanted to just bring up for our, our listeners that I really got from your book is in terms of what's wrong with using command language. And I know from my experience as a coach is that you tell a strong-willed kid what to do and you get resistance, right? And can you talk a little bit about that nervous system resistance? Because I know you mentioned the, the three Fs, the three yeah. F quite a bit. So can you talk yeah. a little bit about what happens within a person often when they get those commands given to them? Yeah. So so when we use an imperative or a question, we're placing a demand. The other demand that comes in in addition to the language that I've been thinking about a lot about lately is even just the time pressure. You know, when we use that, that dem- more demanding language, we're asking kids to do something, but also to do it on our timeline, which might be important. Like I know we have places to go, but it's just another level of demand that occurs that's important important for us to notice and be aware of. So with those learners who <laughs> it, this is harder for, what happens when we place demands is that they could experience that as a stress response and go into or have a fight, flight, or freeze response. So And what that looks like on the other side for us might be challenging behaviors. And it can look a lot of different ways, which I'll give some examples. But I think what's really important for everybody to understand just at the very beginning is that the language that we use can either create a stress response, which leads to fight, flight, freeze, or it won't create a stress response if we communicate in a declarative way where we pace our words to give kids time to think and process what we've said And also where our nonverbal communication is inviting and connecting versus maybe demanding as well, because it, that also matters very much. It's not just about the words we use, but it's about our whole communicative presence of being open and inviting and giving with information so that kids can then have that time and space to make that decision that's helpful and supportive to all of us. But then to go back, so, okay, we might place a demand, get your shoes or whatever it might be and different challenging behaviors that are fight, flight, freeze, and action might be yelling, falling to the floor, bolting, throwing, hitting. It could be aggressive. It could also be shutting down the freeze response. The child, maybe they just lie on the floor and cover their face, cover their eyes. I think sometimes when individuals get older, it can look different and feel disrespectful. They might be sarcastic back. They might talk back. They might swear. And I know like as parents, those can get harder because you feel like, oh, they're being disrespectful to me. But if you can just be present in that moment and notice it's a a stress response in, in response to a demand that we're placing and that we actually have power to change up that dynamic so that we don't ever trigger that, that outcome can just be really different and positive and connecting as we all move forward together. And, and I want to just re- really reiterate for listeners that it's an unconscious, the stress response is unconscious. It's not like kids are deciding to get aggressive or deciding to shut down. It's a, it's a nervous system response to perceived threat, which is the demand. The demand comes across as a, as a threat to the nervous system, which nervous system can't tell the difference between a bear in front of you in the woods or your parent telling you go put your shoes on. And it sounds silly when we're talking about it, but that's really how it registers in the nervous system. Mm -hmm. So we talked about, you know, whether kids, when kids are strong willed and, or however you want to call it, they experience those demands as a stress on their nervous system. The other thing that you talk about a lot in your book where declarative language is, is useful is when kids are, are rigid thinkers or black and white thinkers. And you have a couple of chapters that that I was hoping that we could highlight some of the big ideas from. Of course, everyone should read your book, but let's just give them sort of like a taste of the the possibilities of declarative language because I think they're so great. What I know in my work as a coach is that I get parents who have a lot of trouble with meltdowns because their kids are, you know, as we talked about, strong-willed and resist being bossed around or because they're black and white thinkers and they only, you know, they have an idea in their head. And if it doesn't go that way, then the world is ending. So can you talk a little bit about different strategies that you can use declarative language with for those kids who are those rigid thinkers and where it feels like the end of the world if it if it's not the way they were picturing it? 
Yeah. And I've actually been thinking so much about this lately, just about the idea of cognitive rigidity. And I feel like a lot of it is, well, and I'll just speak to my own experience, is that often it comes down to, of course, how we communicate, but also the time that we give kids to process what we've said. So I think when something drops that's unexpected or not what a child wanted, you see that rigidity because they weren't expecting it and their brain has not yet caught up to integrate that new piece of information. However, in my experience, when we really give kids time and space to adjust to the change and process it, they really do come around. But it's huge and or it's so hugely important that we give them that time. You know, I think a lot about the word no or kids who say no very quickly. And there's actually a article series that I linked to on my website called The Many Meanings of No by Sarah Wayland, who's also an RDI consultant. And I have a video of this of me and my son in action. We'll, we'll link to it on the, in yeah. the show notes for everyone. Going through the no. So essentially, anytime you see that no, that, that feels in the moment, it activates our fight or flight <laughs> almost when we feel that no and we're like, oh, they're being so rigid. Why are they saying no to this? But what's really important is first to take a step back and think about like, okay, what might that no be about? And if I just slow down in this moment to kind of problem solve it a little bit with my learner to figure it out, then we could be at a different place and process through it. So this is, yeah, so this is like one example on my website. I have a video where my son, you know, it was a nice day outside. I wanted to eat outside. We had gotten takeout and he just was saying, no, not going to, nope, nope, nope. And so I got really mad, you know, and just was like, why wouldn't he want to eat outside? Like, why is he being rigid in this way? But then I took a moment, you know, I even had Sarah's voice in my head a little bit, like, okay, I just have to figure out this no. And so in that moment, I could use declarative language to problem solve with them to just be able to say, you know, it's really nice out and I would love to eat outside, but I hear that you're saying no and I want to understand that better. I'm hoping you can help me understand this. And this is also a little bit of Ross Green Collaborative Proactive Solutions. I was just going to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> They're very similar sounding. Mm -hmm. Which I think pairs so nicely with declarative language. So, and in that moment, after I gave him time to process and come up with his own words, he was saying that he was afraid to get stung by a bee in the backyard because he had recently gotten stung by a bee. So for me, I was thinking, you know, that's totally valid. Of course, that's a solid reason for you to not want to eat outside, it might initially be look to me like you're being rigid. But if I can pause, use declarative language to pull that information out a bit more, I can see your reasoning. And then I can also move us both forward to a solution that feels good to both of us also Ross Green. But then I was able to use declarative language to to help him to validate his feelings, but then also help him understand or feel comfortable with how we might be safe from bees outside, you mm -hmm. know, and we could make a little plan if he, if he saw bees or what we might do. So when one way, like the rigidity might be because there's a fear underneath that we, or a confusion or a discomfort that we don't know unless we support our learner to pull it out a bit more using declarative language. And then the other one that I was thinking about just processing time in general, like I find it can be really helpful when I am able to anticipate a change to give kids a heads up. And sometimes we might think about giving a preview five minutes before, 10 minutes before, and that can be great. But some kids actually benefit from a day ahead. Like let's tell them a day ahead that tomorrow we really would love to make this change in our schedule or tomorrow I would really love us to make your lunch together. And even giving them that little bit of lead time to process that information creates a very different result when you arrive there the next day. Mm -hmm. But if you were to say like in the moment, hey, let's make your lunch, or you introduce a different idea that they're not prepared for, you're going to see fight, flight, freeze, which looks like rigidity. But you can really work through that if you recognize that the kids just need a little bit more processing time or lead time, which means, you know, that those are tools in our belt. We just have to be proactive a little bit and recognize that this tiny tweak or this tiny thinking ahead on our part is really going to make all the difference in the world for our kids and our learners and for our relationship for that matter, too. 
it's it's showing respect, right? Mm-hmm. As that there there are people, not pawns, <laughs> in, right. in in a certain way. So I have a feeling that the answer might be this is kind of an art, not a science. But in another part of the book, you talk about how if we have kids who are sort of black and white, rigid thinkers, that we want to change things up so that they don't get. I mean, you you have some really specific things that we can do as parents you know, like, let's walk home from the park this way instead of that way. Um, so that we're modeling alternative, I think you call it alternative thinking ideas. So what's the difference between doing that? Because I know some people that I, uh, Lynn Lyons, who I follow and all things anxiety, she talks about how sometimes giving kids the plan too much can increase their anxiety, because then they always get used to the idea that they're going to know in advance about any changes. Mm-hmm. Did that question make sense? Yeah. So it's more so you're wondering what are incidental ways that we can incorporate opportunities for altern- alternative thinking. Well, using well where's the language? balance between, you know, alternative thinking of changing things up versus giving kids notice when things will be changed up? And, and how do you determine which one you want to use when? Yeah. Well, I think at the end of the day, things are going to happen no matter what. Like we can't prevent things from happening unexpectedly. Like it's going to happen. So that's where you kind of pull in your in the moment tools with declarative language. So separately, if there is a moment that you can anticipate, I think it's great to give kids that preview so that they can be part of the plan moving forward. And Mm -hmm. and it's respectful, as you Mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. But for those moments when you just can't, it's out of your control. It is what it is. You can't accommodate. So in those moments what I really do is use declarative language to help kids regulate. So there's this moment upon you, it's unexpected, the learner, your learner is upset, they go into fight, flight, or freeze. So in that moment, if I, if they're on their way up, if they're escalating and language is, I guess my choice first is, is talking at this moment helpful or not helpful? Because I want to know, should I just be quiet? because they're processing the change and I just need to let them process the change? Or might my language support their regulation in this moment? And if my language would support their regulation in that moment, they're not too escalated that they can take in a little bit more, then I just validate. I have a visual on my website, just different declarative statements that you can use when emotions are escalating. So I think about mirroring what they're communicating so give, us, give us some examples of what that Yeah, or like. validating. So so my son, I'll go back to that. He doesn't want to eat outside. So then I would say, if he was escalating, I could say something like, I hear you. You don't want to eat outside right now. I get it. There's something about outside that's that feels uncomfortable to you. You don't want to. I might... I might talk about... I don't want to label kids' emotions if I don't know what they're feeling. Like, I don't want to take that that agency that's not mine to take, but I could maybe communicate what I see in terms of their nonverbal communication. Like I see that you're shouting. I hear your voice getting louder. I'm thinking you might be upset. You don't like this idea. And what happens is I think when we go to make a change with kids, when they escalate, often people might jump quickly to problem solving and trying to fix, but that's just more information, more ideas that often kids are not yet ready for and you just have to you just have to really hang out in that space of being in that discomfort and letting the learner know that you get it you know this is different you know they're upset you know they don't like it you know they're uncomfortable you know they want x y and z and then what happens is once you use that language to mirror and validate kids regulate you know the time can vary but in my experience it's really i'm always amazed when i When I do this, like kids, sometimes I see kids really escalating and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to do my mirroring statements or my validating statements and I see them come down. And so then you get at that space where you're regulated together and you can move towards problem solving, which gets to that alternative thinking or, Mm -hmm. yeah, I know it's uncomfortable, but we're going to do it a different way. Here are the pieces that I need to decide, but here are some pieces that you could decide, you know, and you might figure out in that moment what pieces you could offer them so that they have some decision making in it. But like you said, it's a it's an art, not a science. It's a dance. I think very much you're reading your learner's cues in the moment because, you know, it's not cookie cutter. It's not a recipe. You really have to just notice where they're at so that you know how much information to give, when to be quiet, when to let them process, 
when to move towards problem solving or alternative thinking. I love when you, I mean, you didn't say this word exactly. You said mirroring, but I always talk about empathy and that nobody ever wants to calm down unless they feel understood. And I think that's, that's what you're, you're talking about there, Mm -hmm. like moving towards the understanding. And also I was struck in your book, how many times you said to wait. And I love that. Like, you know, you make your declarative language statement and then you wait for processing or you wait for them to regulate themselves or even in this case the example that you were giving you just wait and see what happens Mm -hmm. right because you need to like there's two people in this interaction it's not just me Mm -hmm. and you know I talk about this in co-regulation handbook that it's very much about us together and it's communication is a dance it's not just me it's not just you it's both of us and we really have to notice, acknowledge, respond to the communication in the moment of our learner. And if we're going too fast or have too much of an agenda with that we're pushing forward, then we're not leaving space for that person on the other side. And that's when they probably become more rigid or yeah. their behaviors escalate because we're plowing ahead and not recognizing what they might need. And it might just be something as simple as mirroring and validating or time to think and adjust to the change that you've presented, or even ultimately to be a part of that problem solving process. Like we don't have to decide what the what the solution to the problem is, or we don't have to necessarily decide the alternative path that we're going to take. Like sometimes we do, but those are the moments where it's really wonderful to include the learner because then they they get to actually enjoy the process of doing things in a different way, which which is where we want to get to. You know, we don't want we don't want change or difference or novelty to be scary. We want it to we want our learners to see that it's how we grow. It's interesting. You know, that that's what makes life happen in a fun way. But the novelty has to be manageable for all of us. You know, too much novelty is chaos, but just right too little novelty is static and boredom. So we all are just trying to find that just right, just right place of novelty and challenge and change. Yeah. And, and what you, what you, everything you're talking about is like an invitation for kids to be like participants in their own lives. And for, I think for a lot of people listening, they already kind of have, have accepted that idea that, that kids are, I mean, they're not equal to us in a certain way because we need to be this, you know, strong leaders who they feel safe with. But they're as deserving as respect of respect as adults are. But so much of our world is arranged for the ease and preferences of adults. And I think that's what sort of the, the declarative language gets to the heart of is that it's not about like us doing things to kids. It's that, you know, as Alfie Cohn says, like working with kids instead of doing things to them. And this language is just such a great way to support that. That big idea. I love it. Yeah. There were a couple other things that you, that you, the modeling strategies that you talked about in your book for, for when kids are black and white thinkers. I'm thinking about modeling that you, your phrase of we think differently about that. And, and, and similarly, what we are already talking about, um, you know, trying things a different way just to get, to get into that alternate thinking or alternate ways of doing things. But can you talk a little bit about we think differently about yeah. that? So a lot of, kids who, you know, we perceive as rigid thinkers, they also may become defensive when faced with a different opinion or a different idea. And their defenses might similarly go up. So if I say, oh, you know, I really love strawberry ice cream, or I like Star Wars, they might say I'm wrong. (laughs) You know, it's Star Trek, or it's, you know, chocolate ice cream or something like that. And I think you know, of course, it's an important skill in life to be able to consider the thoughts and feelings of other people or perspective take. But what I find is that when we jump too quickly to perspective taking, which might mean like, what do you think that person is thinking? It's a lot of demands quickly. So first of all, we're asking them to think about the thoughts of a different person, which can be hard, and also thoughts that may be different from theirs, which is also different (laughs) and hard. So where I like to start is, is really just helping kids feel comfortable with different opinions. Like just share space and know that that's okay. So when I notice that I think differently or feel differently about something than, than a child that I'm working with or an adult, I, I just say things like, wow, 
we're different that way, or we think differently about this. Isn't that cool? Or that's so interesting that you think this and I think that. It's okay for people to have different thoughts or to feel different things about the same thing. And what you're doing with statements like that is just really creating a safe space for us to be together, even though we think differently or feel differently. Like our defenses don't have to go up just because you like this and I like that, or you think this, or I think that, but rather we can just share space and be different. And that's always the first step. Like I'm not going to rush ahead to what do you think I think? Or what do you think so-and-so thinks? I'm just going to say, wow, that's great. You guys think differently or you think differently about this. And, you know, and it might even be something like, you know, that's what makes us interesting together because we don't always think the same thing. Wouldn't it be boring if we always thought the same thing? And it just, just statements like that, that you can use in the moment when you observe different opinions, just kind of lay the groundwork for, our learners to know that it's safe to be different or have different thoughts or for, for the, you're the communication partner that you're with to think differently about something. It doesn't mean you're enemies. It just means we're different people and that's okay. And these are some of the things that I think cause you know, a lot of heartache for parents when you get meltdowns with these the black and white thinkers or rigid thinkers, because that it's really a lagging skill, right? For, for these kids who only can see one way of, of thinking about these things. And we don't even realize that we have that skill because we so take it for granted in terms of knowing that other people think differently about things and that's okay. Mm-hmm. And it, it's similar to something you talk about in the book that that I know people have heard me talk about before too with flexibility. Like we have to be flexible all the time as adults going through our lives. Like, oh, I wanted to stop for a coffee, but the traffic was too bad. And so now I'm gonna have to get coffee at work instead. And And I know in your book, you talk about saying those things out loud to kids to help them with their flexibility. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I love how you brought that example. So that's just another way that behind the scenes, we can be kind of laying the groundwork for these different thought patterns of alternative thinking, of being okay with different opinions. So anytime in your life when you notice that you've had to make a change, you've had to be flexible at the last minute. It's just really great to say that out loud. I'm driving to work. Oh, there's a detour. I guess I have to go a different way today. Or, wow, I noticed that person, you know, likes something different than me. Isn't that interesting? So I think the more that we can problem solve out loud when we need to be flexible, you know, use alternatives that we weren't planning on. We're just, we're modeling that inner thought process for our kids without putting them in the spotlight and having to do it at that moment. So we're normalizing. We all have to be flexible. We all have to problem solve. Um, We all sometimes have to, you know, do things in a different way than we planned. We all share space with people who think differently. It's just what happens. And we're just modeling even how we handle it or how we regulate in those moments that we might feel stressed when we have to make a last minute change. Yeah, that's great. One one more thing that I hope we can touch on is that is what you talk about with making mistakes or the er- you call it errorless learning mm-hmm. and how destructive that can be. Because I know and so I'm 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 getting like professional development here because I so many of my clients have kids who struggle with all of these things that we're talking about in terms of the perfectionism and, you know, tearing up the paper if it's not exactly the way that they you know, wanted to be or not answering a teacher in class because they're afraid to have the wrong answer. So what are some things we can do as parents, you know, if it's using declarative language or modeling that we can help our kids not be so afraid to make mistakes? Yeah. So let's see, you know, there's a few different things, like, of course, model the mistakes that we make out loud. So again, it's that inner voice when we mess up or do something like say it out loud. So I'm driving and I took a wrong turn. Ah, my bad, I totally went the wrong way, I got to turn around. So again, just normalizing the idea of making mistakes. The other thing that I think is huge is giving kids space to discover their own mistakes rather than jumping in with a correction too soon. So imagine your child is doing their math homework and you've noticed they've made a mistake. Don't jump in and correct because that emphasizes the idea that It's not okay to make a mistake, or if you make a mistake, I'm watching, and I'm going to correct it really quickly, which can feel anxiety-provoking, I think, to kids. So what you can try and do is let them work through 
what they might be working through. And then either ahead of time or after, you could say something like, you know, I'd love to help you with your math homework. So say this is before. I'd love to help you with your math homework. If I happen to notice you make a mistake, would you like me to tell you while you're making the problem or do, or while you're doing the problem? Or would you like me to wait and show you after you're done? So that way you're including them in that process of when they want to receive feedback in a, in a very supportive way. Or if it's a kid where, you know, and I, and I think it is valuable, like let them work through it because if you interrupt their thought process in the middle, then it's almost like they have to start over. So if you just let them do that math problem and go all the way through, then together you can reflect back on the mistake that maybe you've seen. So it might be something like, oh, I'm looking at your problem and I love the work that you did, but I noticed one tiny thing that that maybe we could correct together, or I noticed one tiny mistake on number two. You know, there's different ways that you could come in depending on your learner's how much support they might need. Like you could just reference them to the problem and they could find it out on their own, or it could be something that they need a little bit more scaffolding. And you might say, let's just go through those steps together to make sure that, you know, the answer is what you want it to be. So those are more structured times or academic times. The other thing I think is really great is just is if you can include your child in any routines around the house, like as your partner. So say, for example, cooking or something that you enjoy doing together and as partners. you know, And I talk about this in co-regulation handbook, but you always want to think about a competent role for the child that's contingent on yours as you work together and you share pace or you match pace, like you're always together step to step to step. And as you get kids involved in these natural routines, mistakes very naturally happen. Like you're baking together. Something's going to spill. Like it's okay. <laughs> But you're within that safe, co-regulated activity so that when the mistakes happens, you can practice fixing it together. Because I like to think too about, you know, what matters in life is not that we're perfect because everybody's going to make mistakes. What's important is that we're able to repair a mistake or fix a mistake or notice a mistake. So the more that we can practice those skills with kids, then the more they might feel equipped and competent when mistakes happen. You know, they might, when a mistake happens, it means, ah, I have to fix something and maybe I have to do something different than I did it before, which even pulls in that alternative thinking. So we just want to create those learning opportunities, but in a safe context where it's okay to make a mistake. And you know what? We made this mistake. Let's figure out how to fix it together. And you can always guide that mistake using declarative language like, oh, we spilled milk. Let's think together about how we might want to clean that up. And if it's a brand new mistake or problem that hasn't yet been solved for that child, then you're going to guide it through with declarative language. I know, let's get a paper towel and we can wipe that up. But if it's a problem or mistake that they've experienced, then maybe you just comment on it like, oh, the milk spilled, and then give space for them to come up with the solution. Mm -hmm. So you're just really actively giving kids practice on the repair and the fixing mistakes in a really safe context so that they're less fearful of mistakes as they move forward. I love it. Can you just, before we before we close out here, can you give just a few examples of declarative language versus imperative language? Just a couple of common things that you hear parents say, just so we can have some real like things that they can take away and yeah. try. Let's see. So let's see. So maybe it's dinner time and you want your child to sit. <laughs> The imperative would be sit down. You could instead say something like, wow, the whole family's here together at the table. We'd love for you to join too. Or here's your seat. I'm wondering if you'd like to sit. Or even if it's a child that, you know, stands when they eat, because I know that's important for some learners also. It might just be the goal of inviting them to the table. Like, oh, everybody's here at dinner. We'd love for you to be here too. I'm wondering where you'd like to put your body, something like that. Let's see. Can you think of any imperatives that come up a lot? I love your example from the book of say hello to grandma. Oh, yeah. So somebody enters your space and we always want our kids to be polite and to say hello. So instead of saying something like, oh, grandma's here, say or say hello to grandma, you could just say, grandma's here. Or I see that grandma just walked in the room. 
And again, that just give that time and space for the child to reference that there's been that change in their environment and then see what they might do. So they might, you know, look up, they might notice grandma, they might run over and give her a hug, they might say hi, they might high five. But any of those are really great and okay choices because the child is choosing them versus me who's saying, say hello to grandma, you know, where I'm expecting, I'm the one being rigid, you know? Right. Well, it turns into a power mm-hmm. struggle, right. like, you know, c- c- sit down at your, sit down at the table or say hello to grandma. When you give a command, kids only, they only have two choices, obey or rebel, right? Mm-hmm. And so right. avoiding that whole dichotomy of like, I either have to do what you say or not do what you say. And you, you know, you talk about that you originally this came up because of teaching social learning or for kids who needed social learning, but everybody needs social learning. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's how we evolve to be who we are as adults, right? And mm-hmm. so it's really, I what strikes me is you're inviting kids to notice the things around them, which is what we want them to do is to be able to like notice other people and what other people need and what's happening and be sensitive to their environment and sensitive to their peers and whatever. So it's like that invitation to notice, oh, grandma's here or, you know, the rest of the family sitting down. It, 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 it draws on their own thinking and their own mm-hmm. observation. Maybe you could just tell one, one story from the book about the kid who was laying on the game pieces. <laughs> My son. No. Oh, is it your son? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I have a video that I share in in trainings that I do. So my two sons were we were getting ready to play, and one was like shaking a ball, playing with it. And I said, you know, does anyone want to play this game? And my younger said, son said, I do. And my son, who was shaking the ball, said, Nope, I don't want to. And then I was like, Okay, in my head. I'm noticing in my head, I'm noticing that he's sitting on the pieces of the game that we're going to need to play, but he didn't notice that. So I just, I just said, you know, I think it'll help us if your body's not on top of the pieces. And it could even be something like, well, you're sitting on the pieces. It could be shorter. And so then I gave him a few seconds to process my language because he was also at the same time attending or paying attention to a ball that he was shaking. But, you know, I just gave him like, all he needed rather was five seconds or so. He paused, he looked up, he looked around, he noticed where his body was in relation to, I always like to think about in, in, a, in relation to the big picture, which is me, his brother, the context, what we're trying to do next. And then on his own, he moved his body back. He's like, oh, I am? Okay. And then he moved his body back. So all I needed to do was comment, like your body's on top of the pieces but the imperative would have been something like move back. Mm-hmm. So the imperative tells him what to do, but it doesn't give him any information about the bigger picture or the social context at hand. And it's those pieces that I want him to think about, to be aware of, to take in, and then be that problem solver. Well, and move Whereas, back. Yeah, it, like even when I heard you say move back, I could feel in my body like this, you know, she's she's giving an order here and mm-hmm. and that, you know, my resistance went up just hearing you tell the story. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 So it's definitely that you get that 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 fight or flight back or you feel that demand. And then I always like to think about how even on a thinking level, like you can feel your brain go a step higher. <laughs> If I say move back, it's just you just do it or you don't, like you said, but your body's on top of the pieces. It takes it all up a notch where you have to integrate and consider more pieces and yeah. and be a problem solver. So What's going on here? Yeah. Yeah. Like you can be a direction follower or a problem solver. Mm-hmm. And like we as the communicator in the moment get to decide what's just right for my learner right now. Like, is this a good time to present language that will invite them to problem solve? versus make them follow a direction. Mm -hmm. I love it. Big picture. That is such a good place to close on because it is, I mean, probably everyone's gotten this impression that is going to be work for us as parents to shift our language in this direction, but it, you know, and, and it may make the moments easier, but maybe not at first, maybe at first there's going to be a learning curve and it's going to be more work to be more conscious and intentional with our language and for our kids to get used to that. But it's that big picture that we're looking at. You know, what kind of relationship do we want to have? What kind of respect do we want to have between us? And do we want our kids to be problem solvers, as you said, and and be able to, you know, process the world instead of just doing what people tell them to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Great. Yeah. Well, 
Before I let you go, there's a question that I ask all of my guests, which is if you could go back in time to your younger parent self, what advice would you give yourself? Ah, (laughs) I've heard you ask that and I was like, oh, I don't know. What would I give? I need a minute to think. (laughs) Well, I think, you know, I... I tried to do this when they're young, when they were younger. So my kids now are 13 and 11. And I think just really as much as you can be present in the moment and enjoy kids for who they are at whatever stage they are in life. I just feel like life gets so busy all the time and it's easy to just always think of all the things that we have to get done or feel like we have to be moving at this fast pace, but but I know the moments that I've always enjoyed the most are the ones where I like just can be present in the moment with my kids and let go of all that other stuff and close the computer. And I think I've gotten better at it as I've gotten older because I see them, I see them getting older and I know, you know, there'll be a time when they're not here anymore. So I try hard to do it now. And I would say when I was younger too, or when they were younger, even just do it more. (laughs) Yeah. I love that. Thank you. Where can people find out more about you? My, the best place is declarativelanguage.com is my main website. I have a lot of resources on there to, related to declarative language. I have a weekly blog that I try and publish something every Sunday. And I think like anything, as you try declarative language, you're going to have questions. So I've tried to answer a lot of questions with handouts or blog posts that commonly come up because it doesn't always work right away and it's a dance. So that's just a great place to go for resources and more information. And I'm on Facebook and Instagram as well. I think on Facebook, it's declarative language and co-regulation. And on Instagram, it's declarative language. Great. Well, we'll link to everything in the show notes. So thank you so much, Linda. Mm -hmm. I know that our peaceful parents are going to be so glad to have this other tool in their toolbox. It's been so helpful. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be a part of your community. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. I hope you found this conversation insightful and exactly what you needed in this moment. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Remember that I'm rooting for you. I see you out there showing up for your kids and doing the best you can. Sending hugs over the airwaves today. Hang in there. You've got this.